Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing this morning? One more. Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? That's what I'm talking about. Good morning, First Alliance Church. It's so good to see all of you this morning. So I know normally Pastor Sean or one of the other pastors would give the question, but I'm a little self-centered and I'm going to ask my own question. So anyway, what I want you guys to talk about around the table before we get started this morning is one simple question. How do you pray? We just saw a video, so, you know, do you do it alone? Do you do it with others? Do you speak out loud, keep in silence? Do you have a list? Any listers? No. All right, we'll take a couple moments and just talk around your table or those next to you about how you pray, and then we'll come back together and we'll get started. It looks like we've got lots of good conversations going on. All right, so good morning once again, everyone. I hope your weekends have been going fairly well so far. I know we do have a lot on our minds this morning, but let's just take a couple moments. So how do you guys pray? Who's brave enough to admit? Don't all jump up at once. Bruce. Oh, you lost your list. It's so true. So we, Ruth is a lister, except she just loses her list. Anyone else? Ooh. You shoot arrows a lot? Very good. So as you might have guessed, our topic for this morning is prayer. And we're going to take a look at this through one of God's great prayer warriors, Nehemiah. Now as Christians, we are constantly burdened by the clash of our faith, our identity, and the cultures in which we live, Right? You don't have to raise your hand or anything, but how many of you are burdened this morning by tough ethical situations with financial issues, problems at home, problems at school or work? Or maybe you're being challenged by God because of sin in your life. Trust me, I think we all carry a burden, and we all want nothing more than to be free of it, right? Nehemiah had a burden as well. On his heart was the plight of his entire people, the loss of his personal identity, and a desire for his homeland. But his conditions left him in bondage. This morning, we're going to take a look at this topic of prayer and just how we get ready for what God has in store for our lives. And we'll look through it through a preparatory lens of prayer. Now, Nehemiah is known for his efforts to bring his people back to Jerusalem and the activities he undertook to rebuild the great wall of that great city. However, before this journey could begin, Nehemiah needed to prepare for this journey escape from the bondage of his burdens, and fully embrace his calling. So let's open up our Bibles to Nehemiah 1 and observe Nehemiah as he prepares for this great journey. So just to let you know, I'll be reading in the New American Standard this morning. Uh, there should be Bibles on your table. I believe those are NIV, but feel free to open the translation that you have with you today as well. So Nehemiah 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah. Now it happened in the month Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, 
And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there and the province who, who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who perseveres the covenant and the loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you have commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, through those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote parts of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. So let us go to the Lord in prayer as we start this morning. Will you bow with me? Father God, we thank you for your word and for your loving hand and guidance as we go about our lives each and every day. We thank you for the reality that it was through your son Jesus our sins have been blotted out and that in the atonement you covered our sin with the blood of the Lamb. For we are not perfect, God. We know we cannot live up to your highest expectations. But we glorify you in faith in your son, Jesus, that we can be in communion with you always through faith. Father, open our hearts and our minds as we may learn from your word this morning that you can see in the life of Nehemiah the marks of a true prayer warrior, that we may find your grace in our communion with you and learn from his example. It is in your glorious son's name we pray. Amen. So it really kind of sounds like Nehemiah had a lot on his plate, doesn't it? And we're just getting started of the story of Nehemiah. Well, just to kind of bring you up to speed, prior to this point in history, things had not exactly gone well for the Jews of the region. For years, they were plagued with war between Egypt, Assyria, and Persia. Now, if you take a look at this really big map that you probably can't read the cities on, um, I just want to give you an idea of the land spans and what Nehemiah was trying to overcome and go to God for. So you can see the boundaries in red behind me are the boundaries of the Persian Empire at the time that this story starts. Stretching all the way from modern-day Libya and Egypt and Africa, across the Mediterranean Sea into Greece and Turkey, and all the way across the Middle East to the edges of Asia. To say the least, the Persians had taken a very good chunk of land, and as you'll see behind me in the red box, that's Jerusalem. That's the major city that Nehemiah has now heard of. But keep in mind as we start this story, Nehemiah has never been to Jerusalem. So at this point, Jerusalem had long since been captured, and the remaining of God's chosen people were brought into exile in Babylon, the new red box. So you can see quite a distance had been traveled just in the first captivity. The city and the temple of God was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylon Empire. The city and temple of God had just been obliterated. And with 60 to 80,000 of his countrymen, Nehemiah would live away from their homeland for years, never having seen this great city. By some estimates, Nehemiah was most likely part of a third generation, if not fourth generation of exile. Almost 150 years between the fall of Jerusalem and Nehemiah standing in the court in Susa. This means his parents, his grandparents, and possibly even his great-grandparents had never seen the great city. Now, the Persians would eventually conquer Babylon, and King Cyrus the Great would reign. It was during this reign that the people of God would be released back to their homeland, and where Nehemiah's story begins, under the new rule of Persian ruler Artaxerxes I. 
as the royal cupbearer. So now you can see in the red box even further, this is Susa, the capital of the Persian Empire. So from Jerusalem to Babylon to Susa. Nehemiah and his people were separated from their home, from one another, and had spent years in bondage as prisoners of war in a land that was not their own. They had been under the control and rule of multiple cultures at this point, Assyrian, Babylonian, and now the Persians. Each culture had treated them differently. Sometimes they were nothing more than slaves. Other times they had some freedom but were still considered a lesser class. And finally, they would be treated almost as equals. Almost. It all came with a sense of disconnect with who they truly were socially, physically, and spiritually. In this bondage, this captivity, they had become different people and they had lost themselves. It is here our journey begins with Nehemiah. After years of not knowing their home, of having lost their faith, their spiritual identity, and burdening the weight of a culture that was not their own, Nehemiah prepares himself and his people to return to Jerusalem. The journey will be hard. The mission they are on will not be simpler without opposition. However, Nehemiah knows that in God all things are possible. So let's take a look at what the text actually is really telling us this morning. So as the text start off, we can now see the stage beginning to be set. In Nehemiah 1, verses 1 through 2, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. Now it happened in the, m the month Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, the Hanani. One of my brothers and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity about, and about Jerusalem. Here we learn the background of Nehemiah and his family. We know he was the son of Hekeliah. The text tells us so, though we don't know as much about this father figure. We also know that he had at least one brother, Hanani, though we know even little more than what the text provides us about his brother. And that since he had been back to Jerusalem and witnessed its conditions. Remember, again, at this point, Nehemiah has no prior knowledge of the current condition of the holy city other than the stories from his ancestors. And like much of the oral tradition of the Jewish culture, they're going to tell of the grand days, the days of when the city stood strong, when God stood beside them each and every day in the temple. But we also know that our story begins in what the Jews called Chislev. This is actually most important to this part of the story because this is most commonly known as November, December. So to put it in our terms, this is fall heading into winter. So with that fall coming, and the word from his brother and those that had returned of the destruction of the city, this is important for us to note for a few reasons. First of all, that meant that winter was coming. So immediate travel plans were most likely going to be delayed until spring. And number two, the impending spring meant that a season of war would be approaching soon. Much like warring factions today, spring, summer marks the beginning of combat. During this time, it was no different. Winter simply makes for difficult fighting. We note this as we come to learn of the conditions of Jerusalem in the coming verses, the conditions of the walls of Jerusalem, because it's very important to know that unrest and potential unrest comes with spring. This is just adding to Nehemiah. And finally, we see Nehemiah had a great concern for his people, and even more so of their homeland. He specifically wanted to know the condition of Jerusalem and the people whom he had returned. Note this concern, as it will become more and more evident that Nehemiah's concern is always for the collective and never just for himself. After years of separation, the city that was the cultural and spiritual center of their identity as a people is coming into focus for Nehemiah and as a place of redemption. So we continue on into Nehemiah 1.3, and we just see where the burden is laid upon Nehemiah's heart. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity and in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. As I mentioned earlier, Jerusalem had been taken in war by the Babylonians and completely destroyed. This once magnificent city was reduced to rubble and to leaving nothing behind. Even that of the great temple of the Lord was destroyed and laid waste. Its primary protection, the walls, lay in ruins leaving the city open to future attack. Can you imagine? As a child growing up in exile, you were told the history of your people. 
the one true God in his mighty temple. The remnant, those who had returned with Ezra nearly 15 years prior to this point in time, had rebuilt the great temple. However, the city still lies in piles of trash and completely defenseless. Would it not weigh on your heart to find out that after many years, nothing had changed? It all still lie in ruins. Would you not feel helpless, confused, scared? Would you feel driven to do something? This city was the identity of the Jewish people and the place that the one true God dwelt here on earth with his people. Would you not feel compelled to return to it, to the glory it once had? And when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the Lord of heaven. So here in Nehemiah 1 verse 4, it gives us the first glimpse of Nehemiah's reaction to this report. In the most amazing way, Nehemiah opens his heart to the Lord and bears his soul to God as he shows his connection to his homeland, even though he's never seen it before. As a result of this deep anguish, he goes straight into a state of mourning, fasting, and prayer. Do you see that? Fasting. What does that mean? Well, basically, fasting is when you go without food, sometimes even without water. It is a form of deep worship in response to sin that we little see these days in seeking God. Nehemiah was deeply grieved. His home, his people's identity, his own identity, still lie in ruin and defenseless against future attack. So the following here is a very emotional prayer, a cry out to the Lord that Nehemiah provides an example to his people and to us today on what a vividly personal prayer with God looks like. He falls to his knees and spends the remaining verses interceding for himself, his people, their shared burdens, and the calls on God for help where they cannot function alone. From this example, I think we can all learn three things about prayer that are very practical. So I didn't give you notes this week. I'm sorry. But you have a notes page, and I highly encourage you to be prepared. We have three points for today. And so we'll get started with a prayer that begins in Nehemiah 1, verse 5. And I said, I beseech you, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who perseveres the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. So Nehemiah started his prayer by calling upon the greatness and the glory of the Lord. What would we call this today? It's praise, right? Nehemiah provided praise unto the Lord, and this is our first point. That's point number one, praise. You can, and you can fill these in if you want. Like I said, I didn't give you points, but... You have plenty of room to write them down. So Nehemiah was clearly demonstrating that he understood the Lord's power, his might, and his glory. In a way, Nehemiah started off his prayer by recalling the great acts of redemptive history in God. Nehemiah reaches out with everything he has and focuses on the glory of the Lord, where the Lord literally moved oceans, provided food from heaven, and provided water to those in need. So how do we give God the glory? and lift up the praise that he is due? Well, I think we best glorify God by lifting up those things we see each and every day in our lives that the Lord is working in and around us. So, Sarah, um, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm going to pick on you again. Um, as you recall, a few weeks back, Sarah had been dealing with a lot of different medical issues with her knees, and just there was no end in sight. And she came to us and asked us to pray over her for healing and anointment, which we did. And praise God... Within hours, days, minutes, Sarah was free from her pain and continues to be. Praise be God. We also talked this morning, Pastor Sean asked you, what did we have to be happy and praise in? So many people jumped up. We've heard and we hear the examples of the answers of prayer. So praise be to God. I am sure people can think of other things as well. And when God provided when things were hard, when God brought peace when things felt like they were unbearable, and when God continues to bless us as a church community. To this end, we need to be taking an example from Nehemiah's prayer book and reach out to God by raising up his name and remembering those things he has done for us. 
In all things we pray, we should remain focused on what God did for us, not what we did for him. Answers to prayer do come in many, many forms, though, and this should not be lost in translation. However, one can often point to God's work, and we should constantly remember his work and glorify him for that purpose. This is a humbling reality, and Nehemiah understood it. And with a humble heart and knowledge of the one true God that brings us to our knees to communicate with him. This is not simply us giving a nod to God for talking him up. This is us demonstrating our understanding that God is the all-powerful, the creator, the God of our fathers, the God of mercy, the God of love, and most importantly, the God who gives us grace. So Nehemiah not only gave great praise unto the Lord, he continued in humility before God, where Nehemiah 1, verses 6 and 7 states, Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you have commanded your servant Moses. It was not simply enough for Nehemiah to try and immediately get to his request. He wanted to show humility before the Lord and demonstrate his understandings of the teachings. Nehemiah repented of his sins and that of those around him, giving us the second key point for today from Nehemiah's prayer, and that is to repent. So before I continue much further, I think we, this is a good place for us to remind ourselves of just what it means to repent of our sin. And according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, to repent means to follow or show that you are sorry for something bad or wrong that you did and that you want to do what is right. That is to say, it is not simply admitting that you've done something wrong, but also that you feel remorse for the action and that you're going to physically turn to do the right thing from that moment on. Sadly, I think we lose this action in translation in our culture to just mean feeling remorse. When God truly expects that we come to him with a heart of remorse, with the intention to change the behavior and to hold sin as it truly is. So how many of you remember growing up thinking you could get one past your parents? That's it? All right, some of you we need to talk after church. Maybe you did something you were explicitly told you shouldn't do. Then you try and hide it and you get caught anyway, right? That's normally the pattern. You know the moment when all three names come out of your parents' mouth. Most of you probably don't even know what your middle names are, except for when you get in trouble, right? Don't worry, Mom, this is not going anywhere but dangerous. <laughs> so you always seem to know when something bad is coming when you hear your middle name. So what do we try to do as children? Well, we do what any self-respected, innocent child would do and deny everything. Then when that fails, we tend to try to justify what we have done to our parents by using some type of broken logic, like knowing that the dog would be much happier in the dryer than sleeping in its own bed. <laughs> it seems logical at the time, but okay, so the truth is I never did that to any of my pets. She can vouch. Um, but I'm sure we've all had moments like this, right? Moments that we probably wish we could forget. However, as children and even as adults, we always try to justify that which we know is wrong, right? Do you know why? It's because we know it's wrong. But in explaining it away, we think we feel better. When the truth is, in the failure or in sin, it's still there festering at us. But not Nehemiah. His conviction and his conviction on behalf of his people brought him to a full repentance before God. God calls on us to repent of sin and turn towards God, not away. So why is it so important that we be repentant before God? Well, I think we can take some advice from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, and I have it here on the screen. And what John says here is, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So John's reminding us here that the Lord Jesus Christ has the power to forgive our sins and in fact already has through our faith in him. Nehemiah did not have the blood atonement of Christ, but Nehemiah did know that repentance is how one comes closer to God, and God seeks the lost. 
Nehemiah also knew that his nation had been lost to wickedness and fallen out of step for God's law. And with every ounce of energy he had, he confessed for all of the nation Israel so that God might hear their cries for help. We too can take a page from this lesson. Our culture has made it so hard to admit failure of any type, has it not? Whether it's personal, moral, ethical, or even physical, we simply aren't programmed to give in when confronted. However, this is exactly what God calls for us to do each and every day. We are called to be repentant in sin. That is to admit our failures and turn from them. Just as John stated here in verses 8 and 9, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. In other words, we aren't just lying to ourselves, church, but we're in fact lying to God. In this deception, we act in the nature of our fallen flesh and not in that of our salvation in Christ. God seeks to redeem us and sanctify us that we can become more and more like him. But that requires us to do so with an open and honest heart. God wants to hear from us, but he expects us to be honest and completely transparent with him. So when we are lifting up prayers and praises, also remember to lift up your sin challenges and failings. I know this isn't any fun, but Nehemiah had to lift up an entire nation. But you and I carry our own baggage before the Lord. Let God help you with the weight. And in your humility, God can be further glorified as you grow. It is through the reality of our praises that God empowers us beyond our sins and turns us back towards the track of the glory of the kingdom. And finally, Nehemiah, in verse 8 through 11, has arrived right at the threshold of his prayer, where he hopes to unite the scattered peoples of Jerusalem and return to repair what has once been destroyed. So here Nehemiah states, Remember the word which you have commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote parts of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand, O Lord. I beseech you. May your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. So Nehemiah closes out his prayer and he intercedes directly for his people. Again, right there. Nehemiah had nothing to offer God, but he clearly understood the reality that Israel had gained this punishment over the years by ignoring God and his word. As years of war and idolatry ravaged Israel and Judah, God's people had lost sight of him and fell away. Just as the Lord had promised, and time and time again the people would fail, he would scatter them across the world. However, Nehemiah also knew that a time would have to come that they would be brought together again. And it was in the Lord's glory and obedience this would happen. Nehemiah knew that this meant that someone would have to place their sin before God and ask for his mercy and grace yet again. Through this entire process, Nehemiah had set up the pieces needed to gain God's attention and lay out the repentance of the entire people Israel before God. Through this prayer, Nehemiah hoped to return his people to the Lord and the Lord to his holy city of Jerusalem in victory. So remember the story as we got started about all of the burdens and the bondage of the people Israel. And Israel and their chosen people of God had been tossed about for quite some time at this point. Though all of the trials and tribulations, war, famine, and the like, none of them even thought for a moment about going back to God to ask for help. Ask for forgiveness for having strayed. And they were completely lost in their circumstances. Can we relate, church? Nehemiah saw the history around the situation. But he also saw the reality that God could once again bring his people together and help them back on their way. Nehemiah wanted to stop the cycle of sin and get things back on track, and he knew this was all possible in God's glory. And how did Nehemiah know that? How did he know that God would listen? He knew this because he had his people's history. He knew the story of the Exodus, of the taking of the promised land, and so forth. He knew that God would deliver his people as it had been promised. 
We know this as well, church. In John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, we see again the reality in the New Testament. 1 John chapter 5, 14 through 15 states, This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we have the request which we have asked from him. Christ hears our prayers. Just as we know that God the Father heard the prayers of Nehemiah and the ancestors before him, we pray because we know a God that listens and wants to be part of our lives. So what does Nehemiah do? He closes his prayer by simply asking God for what he needs at this point in time, and that was to reunite his people, return to Jerusalem, and rebuild that city wall. So that's it. Point number three, ask. We may not be on a mission to rebuild the city of God, but I'm pretty sure that you today have something you know you need to work on or something that just seems so overpowering that only God can tackle it. Just like Nehemiah and his people, we all have our burdens to carry. For some, it's hidden sin. For others, it's challenges at work or school over ethics. For others still, it's just making sure that there's enough money to pay the rent this month. And yet, all God calls on us to do is ask. Sometimes it's hard for us to come right out and simply ask for help. It's not in our nature. However, God calls us into personal relationship, and both Nehemiah and John knew that God would listen and that glory would be returned in his name, and we can take comfort in that reality as well. So right about now, you're probably saying to yourself, wow, that Nehemiah guy really had his prayer life squared away. He wasn't a lister. He wasn't whatever that was. But he really had an amazing heart for God. But Pastor Chris, so what? What does this all mean for me and my daily prayer life? Well, the reality here is that there's nothing that God cannot do or accomplish. And prayer is our gateway to seek God in our life. We can accomplish nothing without God. The Bible reminds us of this in every narrative and every message. Nehemiah knew this to be the case and fell to his knees that the Lord might hear him and empower him to do a great work for the Lord in bringing the chosen people back to their homeland to find their identity again in God. Nehemiah's prayer is exactly what we are called to do with our interaction with God and will help us to grow in our relationship with Christ as we learn to pray as God has called us to do and Nehemiah demonstrated. So what was point number one? Good. It was praise. Nehemiah was calling attention to the God who led his people out of Egypt, into and out of the wilderness, and ultimately to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Nehemiah wanted nothing more than to bring that glory back to God, and therefore interceded on behalf of his nation. This is the God of creation, the God of mercy, the God of grace, the God of love, and the God above all things. This is the same God that works in this congregation through our missionaries and through answered prayer as we've heard throughout today and through our constant support as a congregation and a church. He is good and we should give him the praise that he deserves by calling on him who is the I am. Nehemiah reminds us that this isn't about us, but it is about God. So what was point number two? It was repent. After calling on that glory and wonder, Nehemiah humbled his heart and mind in the most amazing way. He took on all of the sin of his nation and their ancestors so that God would hear his pain and woe. Nehemiah wasn't so proud as to deny his own shortcomings before God, though. He was so grieved by the situation in Jerusalem, he took on it all so that God would see his repentant heart and hopefully that of his nation. We, too, need to call out our sin, humbling our hearts, and placing our sin before God is what we are called upon to do. God seeks relationship with us, does he not? But we must be honest with him in our sin. This isn't easy. And most of us probably want nothing more than avoid the conversation entirely. However, Nehemiah shows us that the repentant heart is that which admits our faults in front of God and promises to seek his glory and that which is good and holy. God seeks a repentant heart. 
and hears our calls for help. As we remember John, we deceive ourselves and do not have truth. But if we repent, God hears us and will be righteous. So we must repent and clear the slate before God as we seek his help. And finally, point number three. Yes. Finally, after lying himself bare, Nehemiah lays at God's feet his request to bring his nation back from the ends of the earth so that the Lord could be glorified. He didn't dance around the subject or refuse to ask the guy at the next intersection for directions. That's a different story, but that's kind of what we're like, right? We just don't want to ask. Maybe that's a guy thing. Maybe that's me. He simply wanted to ask God for the help he needed. See the point here, church. Nehemiah didn't seek personal power or success. He sought that which glorified the Lord. Nehemiah sought to bring the identity of God's people back to their homeland, the home where God was the center of their lives and even communed with them in all of his glory. So how often have you been in prayer and we go around and around the issue? Maybe it's only me, but sometimes I feel like my issues just aren't important enough. The point is that everything is important to God. John tells us again, if we ask for anything in his will, he hears us. He hears us. How amazing is that, church? So with the heart focused on God, ask. So what did Nehemiah do in his prayer life? What can we use to grow, church? He first of all gave all the glory to God in praise. That was number one. Number two, he repented of his sin and that of all of his people. And number three, he asked for God's help. It doesn't get much easier than that. And the reality that God is there, wants to hear your prayers, and in the process is glorified, is that not simply amazing? And so as we close today, I want to do something for you. I want you to be able to see God's revelation and his connectedness. That the Holy Bible is his inerrant and perfect revelation is completely connected. So let us pray as our Father taught us. And I have the NASB on the screen, but I know many of you have probably learned it a particular way. But I want us to say the Lord's Prayer together. And then I'm going to show you something pretty neat. So our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this is Christ teaching us how to pray, right? I want to show you something really quick. So take a look at the pattern that we have before us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. What's basically happening here? He's providing that praise to the Creator, is He not? Verse 11. I'm sorry, verse 12. And forgive us our debts. He repents. We see many translations, and I heard many of them as we went through there, but every single one of them is a forgiveness of sin. And finally, verse 13 is an ask that we be delivered from evil. Is it not completely amazing, a perfect and wonderful God that we serve? The Bible is a complete work and revelation of God, and it's all connected. Where Nehemiah knew what he could not do alone, he knew he could do in God's will. He dropped to his knees and sought God in order to bring him glory. And here Christ reminds us this, this model of prayer and how we are to seek the Father. Bottom line, church, is to remember that we can bring our burdens to God and he will listen. However, we must remember that God is going to provide us with the answers that glorify him and his kingdom most. So be prepared for God's reply. And also, like Nehemiah, be prepared to act. God's answer may not always come as we expect or even as we hope. But that is because we tend to focus on ourselves. And God's goals are ultimately for the kingdom. So if you feel like you are completely burdened today, simply cannot connect to God, or it feels as if there's no hope, 
Nehemiah shows us that we can, in fact, provide our burdens up to the Lord, and he will listen. Nehemiah and John both knew that they served a God that wants people to find their way and be together with him. Better yet, it's not hard, right? In fact, if you have not given your life to this amazing God we have in Jesus Christ, you can do that right now. Or come forward during the next song, and we will be glad as a pastoral staff to pray with you and tell you more of a God who listens. For it is through our faith in him that we are saved and our sins are blotted out. Christ covers your sins in his blood, and he gave in perfect sacrifice upon the cross. For he came to live among us a perfect life, free from sin, but then gave of himself on a cross that we all might be free for the burdens of our sin. Nehemiah's heart burdened with passion for the return of his Lord and his people in worship in a rebuilt Jerusalem. And the entire journey began with one simple prayer. Your life, too, can begin that journey or continue that journey in Christ, just as we've shown today, in giving him praise, repenting, and acting. Christ and Nehemiah taught us to pray and provided us with the example that is pleasing to God. Let us bow our heads now and pray as the worship team comes back to the stage. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for Nehemiah, and thank you for teaching us how to pray. Jesus, as we ask that you would come to work on our hearts and our minds when it comes to sin, that we would freely repent and seek you in all things. Just as with Nehemiah, give us the strength to seek you, praise you, bear our sins, and ask for your help as we navigate our lives. It is in your glorious Son's name we pray.